Hello guys, so today we're going to look at the pathologies pertaining, not all, but a good amount of pathologies pertaining to the elbow and the wrist, as well as any other anatomical names and important structures that we'll need to note of. So the first anatomical structure we're going to look at is called the anatomical snuff box. I know it has a funny name. So the anatomical snuff box derives from a particular substance that you would either dip, chew, snort, or any of those means. And in particular in the uh, inhalation version of this particular substance, most people would put it on their body as a nice little pocket to partake in their substance. So this anatomical snuff box is right here in your thumb. If you actually look at your thumb and you were to abduct your thumb out, then you would see that these tendons, these tendons right here, make this little triangular shape right here, which gives you a nice little pocket called the anatomical snuff box. So the anatomical snuff box is made by the extensor tendons of the thumb, extensor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. The top border, if we were to look, the top border was longus while the bottom was brevis. The next term we're going to look at is the thenar eminence. The thenar eminence refers to the big pad of the thumb or the thumb side of the hand. On the flip side of that we have the hypothenar eminence which is the pinky side of the hand or the big mass along the pinky. Another important structure we're going to mention is the annular ligament. As we saw in the joint lecture that this ligament was around the head of the radius and served as a useful structure in the humero radial joint as well as the radio ulnar joint. The next structure we're going to look at is a very important structure in the support of these two bones. As we can see that there is a bit of space in between these two bones and we need that supported. So we have a structure in between these bones, inter bone being os, interosseous membrane. So this is a sheet of connective tissue that is an extension of the periosteum of these two bones that bridges them together, supports them, and serves as a site for muscle attachment. The next structure we're going to look at is called the extensor retinaculum. The extensor retinaculum is very similar to this wristwatch I'm wearing. So the extensor retinaculum is a band of connective tissue right here at the wrist that holds down the extensor tendons leading into my hand. So if I were to take a string and put it underneath, well, don't have a string, if I were to put that string underneath this wristwatch, well, the wristwatch would be holding that string down to my wrist and wouldn't allow the string to come up. And that's the very similar flat fashion that the extensor retinaculum serves. And then again, on the flip side, the um, flexor and extensor retinaculum, the extensor retinaculum on the back of your hand is going to hold down the extensor tendons. Flexor retinaculum on the um, front of your hand here, holding down the flexor tendons that are going to flex your wrist. And then the extensor retinaculum on the back of your arm, holding down the extender ten extensor tendons tendons to extend your wrist. Other anatomical terms we'll see are the volar and dorsal side of your hand. Obviously the dorsal side of your hand would be the back, just like a dolphin or a shark have a dorsal fin and it's on their backs or their spines, the back of your hand is the dorsal surface of your hand, whereas the volar or palmar side of your hand is the palm side of your hand. We'll look at a few words for some very important and particular fingers, mostly related to the types of muscles that we would see attaching to them, one of which, the biggest one, is pollicis. Pollicis is the thumb. I like to think pollicis as like politics, sort of in that uh, Roman Colosseum mindset where we are going to vote, yay or nay. So pollicis, like politics, we can vote yes or no. The index finger is called indicus, like you're indicating towards something. And then the little finger, your pinky finger, is called digiti for digit, minimi for miniature or small. So looking at some of these pathological conditions, we're going to look at some 
briefly their onset and what massage can do for them. So the first one is carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome is typically associated with overuse or repetitive motion. It is chalked up to a repetitive motion injury. Typically people who work with computers or work with their hands and a lot of finger movements. <clears throat> what happens is the tendons that run through the carpal tunnel, as we saw, there's going to be a carpal tunnel right here. We can see that there's two ridges to your, your carpal bones here. And then we'd have that extensor te retinaculum coming over it. And we can see that there is a little space that tendons and blood vessels and especially nerves can come through. So the tendons that are constantly like this, as we're tickling the keys of the piano or the keyboard or anything like that, or at doing any type of motion like this, we're getting those tendons to fire up and down, basically strumming along in a similar fashion like this, which then creates inflammation. And when that inflammation comes in, we have swelling and, and pressure in the area. And so that pressure then builds up and then presses on a very important nerve related to carpal tunnel syndrome, which is the median nerve. So carpal tunnel syndrome can be helped greatly by massage therapists. And it's usually one of the most least invasive actions you can do aside from rest and ice and just letting it be and letting it heal. Take a break and just rest. It's usually the best thing for the repetitive motion side of this injury. Then of course, we'd want to um, release and relax some of those flexor muscles in an effort to help relax and maybe bring some of the swelling down or any of the inflammation, reduce any of the inflammation in the area. So to sum up, carpal tunnel syndrome usually chalked up to the um, repetitive motion side of injuries, usually an inflam inflammatory uh, issue here, leading to compression of the median nerve within the actual carpal tunnel. So we're gonna look at gymnast's wrist next, which usually affects uh, younger children, but people who might be excessively overworking it in the gym, especially doing gymnastics or floor exercises, especially those involving a lot of impact with their hands into a floor or a mat. So as we can see, if we were to look at our hand and see that um, what exactly is the topography of our hand, if we looked at the heel of our hand here, we can see that towards the pinky side, it's a little more shallow. It's a little more of a valley. While when we get to the thumb, it kind of caves up. So it looks like this. We have a little flat plane and then a valley. So that means that we're gonna get a lot of pressure on that thumb side of the hand near the wrist. And that's usually the indication or the kind of diagnosis of this complication is that there's a lot of pain in the thumb side around the wrist, around the thumb and the wrist here, due from that impact. Um, again, it's a bit of a repetitive motion or overuse injury, so the best thing is going to be just resting it and then massage could, in some cases, help. So the next condition we're gonna look at is what we call claw hand or spinster's claw, which is usually an ir uh, issue with the ulnar nerve, which runs along the ulnar side of the forearm and then communicates typically with the fifth and fourth and maybe parts of the third finger there. So what happens is when this irritation comes in, then it makes the fingers retract, which then brings them back into this claw-like position. So they like a little claw with that, ex that extension. Usually can happen too, causes the um, forearm muscles, the extensor forearm muscles to lock up. So in this case, massage can actually be very beneficial. Again, the onset could be idiopathic uh, or it could be overuse and there's a, a slew of onsets in particular. And so some of which, especially if there's uh, over tone in the muscles, a hypertonus in the extensor muscles, massage might be beneficial. The next condition we're gonna look at is called the putrin's contracture. So the putrin's contracture is typically affecting the palmer side of the hand, usually around the fifth, fourth, and maybe even the third um, finger. 
So what happens is it's usually a, like a callus or a shortening of the tissues of the hand, usually at the metacarpophalangeal joint, which if I pinch, if I pinch that part, you can see how my fingers flex down. My fingers are going to flex. So this limits the amount of extension that my fingers can perform at the metacarpophalangeal joint. Uh, not much that can really be done for this. Massage may be helpful in any of the complications, problems, pain associated with this condition, but for any other relief, it might be very limited. Not to say it's a, a real contraindication, but does it have much benefit? Probably not much. The next condition we're gonna look at is de Quervin's syndrome or de Quervin's tenosynovitis. So looking at the second part of that condition there, we can really see what we're talking about when we have tenosynovitis. The word here broken down, if we had took teno, teno would refer to the tendon. Sino would refer to the synovial sheath that is on the tendon that provides lubrication for its movement. Itis is our word that means inflammation. So tenosynovitis is inflammation of the synovial sheath that is on a tendon. In this case, it is around the thumb side, usually on the outer side of the thumb, usually affecting the extensor tendons. This is usually associated with an overuse injury and can develop over time. Uh, massage could be beneficial outside of the rest and just let it heal on itself, as in we could help to, um, again, reduce any hypertonus and then reduce any inflammation in the area. The next condition we'll look at is what we call trigger finger not just like what you shoot with, but trigger finger is a condition where the tendon leading through to the end of the finger, usually on the uh, flexor digitorum superficialis or profundus, is knotted up. It basically has uh, an excess growth of the tissue there. And so when it goes through the little tunnel that is created for it to pass through at that joint, it has such a, a knot. It's almost like trying to pull a knot through a small hole. It just pops through when you pull it. And that's essentially what's going on here. So a building up of tissue occurs usually in between the um, joints here, in between the either um, distal and proximal interphalangeal joint or, or somewhere uh, else in the finger. And then as we try to flex the finger or excuse me, extend the finger, it has to pop through. So it either will develop in between the metacarpophalangeal joint and the proximal interphalangeal joint or in between the interphalangeal joint and the distal interphalangeal joint. And it'll try to pop when we um, try to flex or extend it. Again, massage, really no benefit here. So it's something someone would just have to live with. Massage might be helpful in getting rid of any of the, you know, contributing pain or discomfort or other symptoms around it, but nothing to do with the actual root cause or um, actual curative side of the condition here. The next condition we're gonna look at is called mallet finger, which I'm pretty sure many people might be familiar with. It's kind of like that jammed finger we so often uh, hate to get and might have gotten before. If we try to catch a ball and the ball hits us and it kind of jars our finger, well, that is the technical name for that jammed finger, the mallet finger. Not much massage therapy can do for it. Other than that, we leave it alone. And with that said, the next condition is going to be Jersey finger, which usually uh, results in some sort of damage to the distal joints of the, the distal interphalangeal joints, usually of the first and second, mostly the second, or excuse me, the second and third, the index or middle finger here, because uh, it's more common with football players who try to, you know, grab on to someone and they might catch the Jersey and it, person just like snaps away from them really quickly, which then pulls those distal joints and then causes damage in that manner. Again, massage, very little benefit in this condition. So the next two conditions we're going to look at are valgus and varus. So we can have valgus and varus affecting either the elbow or affecting the knees. So today we're gonna to be looking at the elbow. The elbow itself is what we refer to as the cubital 
region. So don't forget to add that into your names and important structures to know. So cubital valgus and cubital varus refer to the carrying angle of the elbow here. If you notice, if we were to stand up and we were to hold our arms down to the side, you can see that my arm comes straight down and then it kind of forks out and angles away. We call this the carrying angle, which adjusts for the width of our hips. So in these conditions, the elbow is either further out, is either further out or further in which means our, our arm might be further out. So we have cubital valgus here, which we call gun stock position. It's almost like the stock of a gun. So that means we have the elbow further away from the body. This is cubital valgus. Cubital varus is that the angle has been uh, decreased, our elbow is closer to the body, and our forearm might be further away. So the difference between valgus and varus. So cubital valgus, cubital varus, both remembering the uh, reference to the elbow here or the cubit, the cubital region. We're then going to learn about medial and lateral epicondylitis. So obviously we're talking about, if you remember from the lecture on the bones and bony landmarks, we have the epicondyles, epicondyles on both the lateral and medial side. So this would be the lateral side, obviously the further outside from the body, and then this would be the medial side, closer towards the center of the body. So lateral epicondylitis is what we call tennis elbow, whereas medial epicondylitis is what we call gol golfer's elbow. Because of the movements and requirements of those sports, it creates strain on either side of those uh, structures there. So typically lateral epicondylitis, usually associated with the tennis players, can be helped greatly with massage, usually working with the extensor tendons, and then vice versa with medial epicondylitis from golfers who can benefit from flexor work here, as well as um, part of their uh, triceps as well. So just as we had the carpal tunnel issue, which was the tunnel made by the carpal bones, well, we could have the cubital tunnel syndrome or even radial tunnel syndrome. So if we were actually to look at the bones here, we could see that there is a little tunnel right here in the radial side, or excuse me, the ulnar side of the, of the humerus here. So that would be the cubital tunnel, which would be on the ulnar side of the arm here. And then the radial tunnel would be the same thing. There's a little bit of a tunnel, a little bit of a passage for nerves to go through, but on the radial side. So there's three major nerves that run through the forearm here. We have the medial, the median nerve, which runs straight down the middle. We have the ulnar nerve, which runs down the medial side. And then we have the radial nerve, which runs down the radial side or lateral side. So the um, medial side, the cubital tunnel, the ulnar side, we're very, con or very um, aware of this. This is like hitting our funny bone. So if you actually bump that spot and you get that tingling, painful sensation that radiates down into your arm, well, that's, most people say that's hitting your funny bone, but technically you actually hit your ulnar nerve. So that's where we get that pain and, and, and weird sensation. Maybe not necessarily pain, but that weird tickling sensation. That's why we say it's funny, because nerves don't know what pain is without proprioceptive mechanisms, without nociceptors, no, only nociceptors are gonna detect, detect the pain. So usually cubital, or cubital tunnel syndrome affects that nerve. And so we're going to have pain patterns in that similar pathway as if we had bumped our funny bone. And then vice versa, if we had radial tunnel syndrome, we would feel pain or any type of uh, issues along the lateral side of our arm, maybe down into the thumb and first and second fingers. Now, depending on the onset of these, could be idiopathic, it could be damage, it could be you know, muscle tension, anything along those lines, uh, massage may help minutely or could be helpful in a, in a larger way, especially if it's muscular related. We can help relieve some of the tight muscles. If it was connective tissue related, we could help to relieve and do some connective tissue massage. But otherwise, massage would be of limited benefit outside of pain management. So the last condition we're gonna look at is wrist drop, 
which is usually uh, damage or irritation to the radial nerve. So the radial nerve comes down along the arm and attaches and, and comes through the radial side, which will innervate, which would mean talk to or make the extensor muscles activated. So this causes a weakness or a deadening of the extensor muscles of the arm and, and hand of the forearm and hand, which then leads to the inability to extend the wrist, which leads to the wrist dropping. We call that wrist drop. So again, depending on the onset here, massage could have very limited or a marginal increase in benefit, depending on what exactly is causing the irritation or dysfunction of the nerve leading to the extensors. So guys, that's going to do it for us today for the pathologies and need to know things about the forearm and hand. Stay tuned for the next one. I'll see you next time.